Yeah, my name is Joshua Castle. I'm from Curtin University, uh, and today I'll be talking to you about insects and eDNA, as well as my PhD project, which I'm eight months young into, uh, on environmental DNA for the classification and management of plant plant under networks in an agroecosystem. Uh, this work is also supported by ECU University, uh, as well as a host of other um, organisations who have helped funding this research. Um, so, when I get my... Ah, there we go. Cool. So, today I'll be talking to you about eDNA metabarcoding. What is it? Um, the challenges with metabarcoding as a technique. Clearly, all uh, DNA technologies have their qu uh, quirks, and eDNA is no different. Um, what research is being broadly done at Curtin University with insects? And then after that, I want to jump into pollination and why eDNA might be a useful tool um, for helping te uh, measure taxonomic diversity. Uh, and then lastly, I'll be talking to you guys about my avocado research uh, and what I've been up to um, using eDNA. So firstly, what is environmental DNA? Um, it comes in two flavors. There's abiotic or biotic. And by abiotic, I mean samples from living organisms uh, that have left traces in either soil, water, or air. So for example, you might get fungi samples from soil, uh, and so you'll be able to work out the taxonomic diversity of deceased fungi or living fungi in a soil sample. You can get fish DNA collected in water, uh, as well as seahorses and anything really that sheds DNA in the environment. Uh, and then also air, you can get airborne pollen samples from air samples. And then in biotic, uh, by biotic eDNA, I mean DNA from the organisms that, for example, parasites or flies interact with. So by this, what I mean is you can collect um, DNA from the gut contents of mosquitoes to work out what interact with par what hosts they've been parasitizing. So this can be a measure for, for example, mammal diversity in a region. You can extract DNA from a mosquito and work out, you know, how many different animal species has it parasitized, which starts to give you a biomonitoring tool for a region. You can also do a similar thing with flies um, because flies need carrion to feed on. Um, you can actually get the gut contents of flies uh, and sample it for fecal DNA um, and then also get measures of biodiversity for larger organisms which they interact with. Uh, and another example of this is also, of course, pollinators. So because pollinators collect pollen, obviously, on their bodies as they forage among flowers, that pollen can then be washed off an insect and then that pollen can be uh, extracted and then amplified up and we can actually target um, to see what taxonomic diversity of pollinating uh, of, uh, plants have been pollinated or at least visited by those insect species. And the real power of eDNA is that it has low intraspecific variation. So two samples from the same species can't be differentiated. So if there is a species which occurs twice in a sample, it will only come up as one reading but it has high intraspecific diversity, which means that you can distinguish between species. And this is where the real power of eDNA comes in as a biomonitoring tool to look at taxonomic diversity in a sample. The one thing eDNA can't do is it can't tell you if more sequence reads correlates positively with more of a specific insect. So for example, if you have a flower that has large reads of honeybee, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've got lots of honeybee visits. It's, it could be that eDNA amplifies up honeybees biasly because they amplify it very well, but it does let you get at this taxonomic diversity, you know, presence, absence, what species are in your sample and how many. Um, and so it's a very powerful technique from this. But like anything, I'm going to give you some caveats. So let's get the bad stuff out of the way first. eDNA, it's expensive. Um, the reagents, the sequencing, the training, um, everything costs quite a lot of money. And this isn't a problem when you have a few samples, but when you have large scale studies, the costs quickly add up. And so you have to be thrifty with eDNA. You have to keep your samples small and you have to pull them where you can. The time taken for the workflow of eDNA is also quite long. It can take generally a month to get from sample to bioinformatics and results. Um, and this can vary depending on the scale of the project. Largest projects are probably going to take longer. The next problem with them is that they need an extensive and well curated library online. And these libraries rely on the work of taxonomists to upload sequence data. Um, if the library isn't there online, then researchers need to create their own. 
Um, and if the researchers don't create their own and just rely on the online database, then you can actually miss diversity because those samples aren't going to be present and you've got nothing to refer to them online as, uh, online as. And so you're only as good as your library. And then lastly, like anything, uh, contamination is a huge issue. With anything D DNA, contamination is always a problem, but especially with trace amounts of insect DNA or DNA from organisms. We're talking like one or two sequence reads counting as a result. And so if even there's the slightest bit of contamination, you can get problems. One case study that we had at Curtin uh, and a famous story that we talk about is that there was a plant sample, a flower actually taken from the Pilbara. And uh, the researchers were quite surprised when they sequenced the results to find that it had tuna and mango DNA present on the flower. And the reason is, is that the researcher hadn't worn gloves when they were collecting it and then had a tuna and mango chutney sandwich for lunch that day. And so the results, of course, come back and tell you that, you know, this has been visited by a tuna and a mango. Now, of course, ridiculous, I know, but it highlights, I think, you know, how powerful this technique is, but also the risks that come with it. And so negative controls are paramount when doing eDNA work. So despite its challenges, Curtin has really doubled down on insect DNA um, and eDNA metabarcoding at large. And before I jump into my project, I want to talk about my colleague who actually presented uh, in this uh, group a little while ago, uh, Kristen Fernandez, uh, and just quickly talk about her research and what she's doing with insects. So Kristen is really interested in using invertebrate eDNA metabarcoding as a biomonitoring tool for arthropod biodiversity and the biodiversities of the species that they interact with, whether or not this be plants or animals. So Kristen really has three main areas that she's targeting. The first one is identifying how native bees respond to urbanization through looking at the contents of bee hotels. The second one is the response of ground arthropods to the exploration infrastructure at mine sites. And then her last project is looking at the vertebrate, uh, the eDNA from vertebrate fauna and the guts of carrion flies across different ecosystems. And this project in particular is quite interesting because what she's doing is setting up transects away from Perth Zoo of fly traps. And what she's doing is that she's capturing these flies at varying distances from Perth Zoo and looking at the gut contents to see if she can get reads of exotic fauna from different distances from the zoo. So for example, how many reads of lion DNA do you get at 20 meters from the zoo versus five kilometers versus 10 kilometers? And so how far are these flies traveling from the zoo? And although this seems like a bit of a niche case study, you know, what's interesting about it is it helps um, practitioners work out if you've got, for example, tigers in Indonesia, what distance are you going to get resolution on with this technique and knowing you know how far these flies are traveling what kind of re questions can you answer and what practices do you have to put in place so that the answers that you're getting are meaningful so that's all i've got to say of kristen's research it was just short and sharp for her but um you can actually contact her on twitter or she's very active on emails as well so she's more than happy to respond to any questions or anything that you guys have. Um, I asked her beforehand about that. So feel free to send her an email and I can provide extra details if needed at the end. But I'm on to bore you with pollination. So before I launch into avocados, eDNA and everything in between, I thought I'd just provide you guys with a case study of why pollinators are so important. Um, I found this paper a little while ago and it really spoke to me. I thought it was really interesting. It's rare that papers do that. Mostly they put me to sleep, but this one was very interesting. Uh, so this paper is human pollinators of a fruit crop in Maozhen County in China. The authors, Partap and Ya, surveyed this region twice, once in 2001 and then again in 2011. And what drew them to this particular region of China is the fact that human pollinators had been used in the region since the 1980s. The reason for this is that human pollinators were necessary because there had been four decades of insecticide use prior to this. Now, of course, when you use insecticides for such a long period and they were using them eight times a year, uh, they decimated the local insect po population. Uh, this plus the removal of remnant vegetation from the area meant that wherever there were like last vestiges of life for insects, they were killed and there were no pollinators anymore. And this is significant to the region because they grow apple trees there uh, and there's many apple orchards. And these apple trees rely on cross-pollination between complementary cultivars. 
And as a result, in the 1980s, there was a huge uh, drop in fruit set and there was a kind of um, a crisis moment. And so what happened is that the local orchard growers hired human pollinators to come into the region. And they, uh, so this obviously had been happening since the 1980s. And these two authors got wind of it in 2001 and came over to visit. And what they found was really interesting. Um, human pollinators were paid $2 a day to pollinate between five and 10 trees. And at the end of the season, the authors measured um, fruit set and found that 100% of fruits that had been pollinated were pollinated by humans and only humans. So they really had killed everything. Um, and what was interesting is that when they came back in 2011 for their second survey, what had actually happened in the interim is that all the low paid pollinators, human pollinators had moved into the city uh, to get high paid work. And as a result, the demand for pollinators increased. And so did the price. So a pollinator, a human pollinator was gone, uh, went from $2 a day to 12 to $19 a day. On top of this, other regions started growing apples. And so the competitive price for apples um, decreased. And as a result, the market value for apples in the region also decreased, meaning the margins were smaller. And actually what ended up happening is that the local orchards had to remove all their apple trees and replace them with self-pollinating plums and locusts because the industry was no longer sustainable. And I think that, you know, what this really shows is that human pollinators, sorry, human pollinators, firstly, aren't a good alternative. Uh, but it also goes to show, you know, insects cannot be replaced. Um, their role as pollinators is often forgotten, I think, um, but they are fundamental to the functioning of all ecosystems, whether or not that be agricultural or native. And what this case study really highlighted for me was that you know, in their absence, we are helpless. We absolutely need insects and pollinators and research into them is fundamental for our survival as a species going into the future, but also just for sustainability and maintaining biodiversity. Um, and so that's why, you know, this is my passion. I'm so interested in pollinators and uh, that's really why this work is now being commenced in kind of working out better tools to use um, in pollination studies. And that's where eDNA comes in specifically. So typically, you know, when we go out and we do manual observations for pollinators, we will stand and watch flowers and, you know, we'll be there with our books and we'll be recording interesting things. We'll be recording the duration that an insect is visiting a flower. We'll be recording interesting features about that visitation, maybe how many times a particular insect probes a flower. And then, of course, we want to record what the species is, the taxonomic diversity of the thing that's visiting so that we know, you know, who's doing the pollinating or at least who's a flower visiting insect. Now, this has been crucial, this manual observation into getting us to this point where we understand so much about pollination. But, you know, as we move on to ecosystem and landscape scale problems, especially with climate change, uh, especially with biodiversity loss, this, this tailored hand experience is limited. And I think that um, those limitations are very pronounced when you look at it on such a big scale. On small scales, it works, but on big scales, you've got these limitations of the time investment. You know, to monitor an individual flower can take 20 minutes. To monitor 20 plants, it then is just accumulating so much time. And as a result, you know, you get a limited number of observations that you can put in into a day. And on top of this, for anyone that's done pollination studies, you know, taxonomic expertise is paramount and it's very difficult to identify species without destructive sampling. Um, and, you know, a lot of these things, we don't like to kill the species that we watch, you know, we do actually genuinely like them. Um, and so, you know, the taxonomic expertise required is huge. The sampling required is often destructive. And because we're out there in the field watching these pollinators for such a limited time, we often miss rare species. And so when we are classifying the diversity of what's there, we're not capturing the whole thing. And so there's a need in this area of research for tools which are gonna help enhance our studies. It's not to replace manual observation, but it's to help benefit us so that we can actually cover a larger area and get a picture of the things that we often miss. And so that's where eDNA comes in. So I'm taking a plant perspective on eDNA. Uh, I am a botanist at heart. Uh, and so insects are my second love. Um, but 
from a plant perspective, what happens is when an insect will come and visit a flower, obviously it's going to interact with the flower. And then once it leaves, it's going to leave traces of its visit, whether or not that be fur, hair, scales, anything. Uh, and so I've represented that here with blue dots. But anyway, DNA is left on the flower. That flower can then be taken as a sample and then that sample can then be extracted. Now you can also, you can do this on the individual flower level, or if you're an avocado tree and you have a million flowers per tree, you can do this on the inflorescence level. You can take a whole inflorescence as well and turn it into a single sample by grinding it down. And that's what we're doing for my research. And so what you do is when you've got this sample with both your plant DNA and your insect DNA, you then amplify up your insect DNA of interest using specific primers. For us, in my project, I'm using two mitochondrial genome primers, 16S and CO1. These primers amplify up your region of interest, and this region of interest is then blasted against that online database, which is that curated library that I was talking about previously. And you can also use a custom database if your species haven't been sequenced before. And then you blast this against your online database, and all being well, and uh, the species are actually there, you get a species identification. And this is how we're kind of pulling out this taxonomic diversity, this presence absence. And so the technique is very powerful for being able to work out, you know, who are your flower visiting insects? Obviously, pollination is a few steps further down the line. Pollination requires you to say this insect visited and um, without anything else visiting, a fruit was produced. And so we can say that in the absence of self-pollination, that this insect is a pollinator. But if we're talking about flower visitors and just trying to get an idea of the cohort that is visiting, eDNA is a very powerful tool. Now, there's a question of why on earth would the avocado industry be interested in eDNA? Surely they make enough money with, you know, avocado and toast, avocado smash on toast and guacamole and everything else. But the reason that there's interest in this is because it really is this knowledge gap that exists in the industry. Pollinators, is it wild? Is it managed? They're mostly doing the job. The industry isn't quite sure. Managed pollinators are brought in often, but it can be expensive. One avocado grower in Queensland brought in uh, honeybees at a cost of $40,000. Um, wild pollinators are obviously beneficial because they're free, um, but their effectiveness varies um, and people just aren't sure exactly, you know, who's doing the job and when they're doing it in the season. The next question that exists is how do pollinators vary both across a flowering season and also how do they vary spatially within an orchard? Do they tend to aggregate both if we're talking about height, do they aggregate near the ground and then come up to the tree during the heat of the day? And then if we're talking spatially in terms of across an orchard, um, do they congregate near the edge where there's potentially remnant vegetation and then only serve as the trees on the outside or are they kind of dispersed throughout? Again, questions that remain unanswered. And then there's also this idea of how do co-flowering species affect avocado pollination? If you've got peppermint trees flowering in October and November, does that mean that there's competition and so that you get fewer pollinators in your avocado trees? Or is there a bigger cohort of insects drawn into the area because there's more resources and so you get better fruit production? Again, questions that people are currently unsure of. And so what really this all comes down to is can you use environmental DNA to classify flower visiting insects to try to get at some of these questions that just remain unanswered? And so the three objectives of my study really are to see if using eDNA, we can work out who the flower visitors are, then using a combination of eDNA and bagging experiment, experiments, work out who the pollinators are, and then see how these pollinators vary both spatially with co-flowering resources and across the flowering season. So the overview of the research that I'm doing is firstly looking at, you know, when we take eDNA from flowers, can we work out the flower visiting cohort? Then with this flower visiting cohort, can we work out how they visually, how they vary over time, how they vary with co-flowering resources and how they vary spatially within an orchard. Of the flower visiting insects, which actually, actually affect successful avocado pollination. And then the last chapter, which is a little bit experimental, is if you plant native Australian plant species in an avocado orchard, can you actually create more resources to draw in more pollinators to lead to more successful avocado pollination? So, I just wanted to talk to you about just the first chapter, the little bit that I've done so far, uh, only eight months in, so it's been a rush to get to this point, but so far it's going well. Uh, and I just want to talk to you about the first chapter, which is examining the effectiveness of eDNA for flower visiting insects and pass avocados in two orchards in the Southwest. So the first orchard is in Marinbrook Farm in Middlesex, run by Doug. 
And the second orchard is Bendotti Avocados in Pemberton run by Shane. And what we did in both of these orchards was a three method approach to verify how effective eDNA is. So what we did is we set up camera traps to monitor inflorescences. We then set up pan traps to measure insect community diversity within an orchard. And then the last thing we did was do this collection of inflorescences to get eDNA of flower visiting insects. And the reason we came up with this three method approach was to see the congruence between the three methods and see if eDNA was the most effective technique. So the idea is, is that if we've monitored an inflorescence with a camera, we'll get a certain insect diversity uh, present. Then we wanna see if this matches up with the eDNA. So for example, what we have here is these two insects have been monitored by the cameras and the eDNA agrees with these results. But an alternative scenario that we may find as we go is that the cameras may show that you have um, these two species visiting, but the eDNA only shows that you have one species visiting. If this is the case, it suggests that maybe eDNA metabarcoding isn't the best technique to, uh, for to measure taxonomic diversity for flower visiting insect species. But again, this is this idea. If we use three methods, we can see if they agree with one another or not, and then we can verify if this technique is actually gonna work. So some very, very early results. Uh, I just wanted to show you some of the video footage. So the videos are captured with GoPros, um, Hero 7 Silver, uh, if you guys are into cameras. And um, what they were done is they were set up on time-lapse to capture an image every 0.5 milliseconds. Um, and they were left for 12 hours out in the field to kind of capture a whole range of observations. And they were set up at the beginning of the season in early October, and then set up in the peak season in late October, early November. And although I'm still uh, trawling my way through this footage, I'm starting to see a little bit of a trend in it which is quite interesting, which is that you see this variation in the community that is visiting avocado trees. Um, you see in the beginning, in the colder months, there's a lot more honeybees uh, and there's a lot less diversity present in the orchard. And then as you move to this peak season, you see this overwhelming mass of hoverflies come into the area. And they, as you can see from this footage, they just are visiting like multiple visits a second. Um, and it's really interesting to see that community shift. And um, as I'm kind of keep going through this data, I keep seeing this come up and it's really interesting. Um, and then if I kind of pivot over now to the eDNA results, if we ignore the ground dry and the wash, this was from a pilot study, these results, uh, the actual samples I'm still processing as well. And um, these are just a small subse subsection of those. But what we're finding from these eDNA results is, you know, you're getting this pollinator or potential pollinator flower visiting uh, diversity. You're getting your hoverflies, you're getting your honeybees. But on top of that, you're starting to see other things come out in this. You're starting to see moth species, which are often missed during daytime observations. Now, whether or not moths affect ED, uh, sorry, avocado pollination is still up for question, but it has been noted in New Zealand that they do. So this is an interesting result that starts to come out of it is that you're starting to get diversity that you normally wouldn't get with human observations. And then on top of that, you're also getting these other species, which might not be pollinators, although thrips have been known to pollinate some tree species, but you're getting mites and bark louse. And I start to, as I go through this data, I start to kind of get a bigger picture of than just pollinators or flower visitors. And it's this kind of ecological community picture. You know, you're getting your flower visitors, your potential pollinators. You're also getting potential pest species. And then as we go further, we might also see potential predators such as ladybug DNA. And I think what this speaks to is that eDNA, sure, it's good for measuring, you know, flower visiting insects, but it does also give you this community picture, this overall web that is occurring in an orchard. And it does indicate to me that this would be a very powerful tool for, um, for managers as a biomonitoring tool to tell you what's on your orchard, who's pollinating, who's your predators, who's your pests, and allow for more effective management strategies. I think we still live in the 1950s with some of our management strategies on avocado orchards and other farms where we just spray insecticides and hope for the best. Um, I heard of a cherry orchard in Donnybrook that uh, had no pollination at all because they'd been spraying too many uh, insecticides in the last few years. And again, like I use that China example as an example, as an extreme example, but it is apparent that we still do this. We still do kill everything and treat, and like our orchards and our like natural remnant vegetation are ending up like Chernobyl. Um, and I think that the strategies that we employ are so important and we need tools to monitor that. And I think eDNA is a really powerful technique that 
if we can like use it and utilize it on a big scale, we can be more effective land managers. Um, so that's all I've got to say for today. Thank you all for listening. I hope I didn't bore you too much. Um, the last thing I just wanted to say is a thank you to my two amazing volunteers, uh, my mum and my granddad, who's 92 this year. Both came out with me to help me collect the uh, results and set up the cameras and the pan traps. Um, but yeah, that's it, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and are there any questions? Uh, okay, if um, anybody you know, has any questions, they can either ask them here with their microphones switched on, or they can put them into the uh, chat window. You should have a link to it at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screens uh, there. Thank you very much for that talk. Mm. No worries. I'm pretty sure that we can put that straight up onto the uh, Society's YouTube account. Perfect. Can I uh, ask a question? Absolutely. Um, one of the photos I took when we were down on the avocado orchard was a beetle, and it was actually on the netting of one of our cages, not actually mm -hmm. on the tree itself. But on the back of the beetle, there were six or seven mites in the photo. Yep. So if this beetle has just had the mites on it, Will that DNA then transfer to any avocado it visits? Absolutely. Um, so if you get, for example, um, there are also mites that occur in bee nests as well. And so if that mite DNA is on the bee and then the bee visits the flower, then the mite DNA is then on the bee, which is then transferred to the flower. And so you get both. Um, so it's that powerful. Um, and because we have, because we like, our cutoff is one read. So if there's one sequence, we discard it, but any more than one sequence, be it two, three, um, individual sequences, we count as a, we count as a sample. So, um, absolutely, you know, it is powerful enough to get the mite off a beetle. So, um, and that's where it's really exciting as a technique. Mm. Does anybody else have any, um, uh, questions? Oh. Oh. Does it do cat DNA? Does it do cat DNA? I wish it did cat DNA. Uh, that would be very good. I, I've got two cats of my own. Uh, I don't think they'd be too impressed if I was sequencing them. But, uh, but yeah, it would absolutely do cat DNA as well. Although my primers are very specific to insects. But uh, oh, if you use yeah. the right ones, you would be able to get cats. So, so as a word of encouragement, you were saying that one of the limiting factors was the time it takes to process Yep. at the moment. So I hate to say this, this sounds about... 40 years ago, I was involved in a project when I first left uni where yep. I was extracting the um, RNA from a sheep squamous cell carcinoma. Okay, wow. Okay, yep. And that, that, that was the beginning of the research that ended up becoming um, the, the, the uh, vaccines we use for girls so they don't get wow cycle cancer anyway yeah, yeah yeah that's amazing but that used to take us a week <laughs> to do that extraction right yep and then a few years ago i was at um a, i think it was wildflower society meeting i can't remember what the subject even yep. was and i saw someone right in front of my eyes do this exact same thing in five minutes and i was like wow <laughs> So well, some you don't have to wait 40 years. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. As the techniques become more pronounced. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Look, I hope that comes sooner than the end of my PhD because it would be very much appreciated. But yeah, I know your pain. I know how long it takes. So there you go. There's hope. <laughs> <laughs> that certainly covers one of my questions that I was about to ask. Oh. Uh, uh, I... Um, as you mentioned, the need for a comprehensive uh, gene library to compare your results to, I yep. imagine that uh, with each different agricultural area around the world, you're going to need to have somebody doing the preliminary um, gene studies. Uh, even if you've got a comprehensive one for Australia, got, you cannot immediately do the same tests in, say, New Zealand or the Pacific Islands mm. if you won't have the same gene library results. It could get quite misleading uh, results. Uh, there, but I imagine that if the cost of doing the studies and building the gene libraries uh, drops as technology advances, then that'll be a um, much easier uh, task. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's one of those things that like, if, for example, you were to do a study in Australia and then use exactly the same markers and go to the Pacific Islands, for example, you would only be able to capture the diversity of species that are shared between those two regions, which would have been, of course, invasive species. That would be the European honeybee. That would be um, maybe bumblebees or anything else in between that is shared. But the, you know, the intricacies and the specific diversity of both regions would probably be missed. You know, you would only be capturing a little bit. So I think, you know, Sanger sequencing um, as a technique is quite cheap at the moment, but it still does require the right um, laboratories and the right technicians to get it done. Um, but absolutely, as this technology does improve, the ability to do this um, and to have a practitioner go out in the field beforehand, do a preliminary survey, like we do with misnetting at the moment, you know, to be able to do that survey initially to tell you what's there, that is becoming more and more and more, and more achievable. Um, at the moment, it is still expensive and it is still, um, it, the power is instilled with the people that have the knowledge and it's still kind of very concentrated. But my hope is that as this kind of becomes more broad scale, um, there are more practitioners and it becomes lower cost. So that this is actually a technique that, you know, anyone can really use when they've got kind of the, the right questions to answer. Are uh, you no doubt familiar with the uh, news article, I think it was last year, uh, with the suggestion that the Loch Ness Monster was actually a giant eel. Based on the oh. amount of um, eel eDNA they were getting out of uh, the lake. I love that. That's so interesting. Uh -huh. um, what sort of uh, misleading results uh, might you get from e uh, DNA studies of uh, pollinators uh, based on what kind of, which what species of pollinators were giving disproportionately large results? Mm. Um, at the moment, so just early results, but um, capsid, capsid bugs seem to be crazy amounts of DNA compared to everything else. Um, I don't know much about capsid bugs, but... Capsids they're... now called the mirrored. Mirrored, okay. Mir Mirrorday? Course, Mirrorday? Right. Yes, mirrored. Got it. Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm still stuck in the 1990s. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, so uh, mirrored bugs are overrepresented in all my samples, and I can't tell you why. I don't know why, but I think it's... Um, and this is just a pilot study. This is from a different location, so not not um, not down at Pemberton and Middlesex where I was sampling. But their insect reads are massive, and I can't tell you why that is. But it's because they're overrepresented. But that's why we don't use sequence abundance as a measure. What we use it as is we just have to see if the sequence is there or not. If it's two sequences, or if it's fifty thousand sequences, that we can't use that as a quantity because if there's biased amplification it doesn't necessarily mean anything with those numbers. So instead we say zero, one, is it present? Is it absent? And we just do that across enough samples to tell us, okay, it's present on all these different trees. So, you know, you must have kind of at least this many visitors. But um, in terms of, yeah, what we're getting at the moment, which is disproportionate lards, mirrored bugs, absolutely, they're, they're fiends. They're taking up a lot of my DNA sequences. Well, they were definitely there in Pemberton and Basildon. Interesting. Inter Can you send me some pictures of some? Because I don't even know what I'm looking for. Yeah. <laughs> I've got, I think I've got some on that Dropbox link, but I'll send you through. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that'd be awesome. Because yeah, I, I, when I saw that, I was like, I don't even know what they are. <laughs> I, think I saw at least three different species while I was down there, but there were probably more because I can't tell the species apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's possible that they're actually getting ma uh, uh, macerated with your samples. A lot of the mirrored bugs are very small. Ah, that would, and that would absolutely be it. And I think that that would make sense as well because the sequence reads are massive and you would almost need the whole insect in there. Um, and I think like what we've been very cautious of is to try to keep out, you know, if we see a bug in there, take it out of the sample because it's going to be disproportionately large. But obviously when you're dealing with a whole inflorescence, it's a very 3D structure. Um, even pulling off all those flowers, you can miss species as well and they can get incorporated into the data set. Would, would aphids be giving you the same sort of results by any chance? Uh, it's interesting. I would have thought the same thing, but uh, aphid DNA has not been nearly as um, uh, nearly as ubiquitous as this uh, mirrored mirrored. These on the so avocados that we were surveying. They were, or they weren't. Sorry. No, they weren't. Interesting. We went to so honey bees don't like them, and aphids don't like them. <laughs> Maybe they just don't like aphids, aren't so keen on the avocado. Maybe. Itself. Yeah, yeah. Aphids can also be very fussy about what sort of host plants they are really? used on. So, very fussy. That's fascinating. Why is that? Because of the, the sugar contents of the sand? 
Well, some of them are relying on the um, chemical defences of the plant for their own defence. So you'll get uh, milkweed aphids that will only uh, grow on milk on uh, regional milkweed plants. Mm. So forth. So the big fuss about what sort of um, plants they're attracted to, like the sour thistle uh, aphids, which only go towards sour thistles and the related uh, dandelions mm. and um, uh, the like. So if it isn't a particular uh, avocado aphid, yep. then they might not be showing up. Whereas the myriads are much more um, generic plant sucking bugs. So how interesting. That's that, but I love it though, like because you know, like I, I do not pronounce to be an expert on insects at all. I am very uninformed. But, uh, you know, I love plants, um, but like, it's so interesting to kind of hear this and then start to put the story together because I can start to see how it feeds into, you know, my results that I'm starting to get. Um, and I find it fascinating that aphids are so fussy and but mirrored bugs aren't. It, it starts to make a lot of sense. No, I love that. There's also two other things that could be causing it. Is it Daniel just said that they like the um, dandelions and the thistle and the weeds type thing. Mm. I know at least on Doug's orchid, orchard there was lots of weeds yep. and they probably were down on the ground in the weeds yeah, and yeah. the tree's not of interest to them when they've got that other resource yes 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 um and the other thing is we had at least six species of ladybirds on our trees mm. and they would have had a nice lunch on all of the aphids yeah yeah absolutely yeah and we did see ladybirds actually that's why i included that as a when i mentioned potential predators uh, we did see ladybirds on some of the tree species, but I haven't sampled enough of the inflorescences to tell you if their reeds are actually there. Um, but yeah, ladybirds are absolutely on these avocado trees as well. So it's a whole ecosystem that's happening on the scale of, you know, an individual inflorescence. It's wonderful. I think it's... Oh, am I muted? No, I'm on. No? Um, I think it's great the way that you can... On one hand, you're looking at the minutiae of minutiae looking at the DNA, but think at the ecological level at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's great. <laughs> it's really exciting, isn't it? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree yeah. more. <laughs> well, it's certainly a burgeoning field, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and I think, like, like anything, it's important. Um, I, can see, I can see some people in the area, you know, don't get too lost in the technology. Like, eDNA is amazing, but... You know, for me, it's really the study of pollinators is the, my passion. You know, like I think eDNA is fantastic, but, you know, pollinators are just wonderful. And I think it's so interesting to understand that dynamic. Um, and, you know, eDNA will come and go like other technologies, but um, it's so exciting to have it as a new research field and to, you know, be able to fuel interest in these different areas and, and you know, bring greater awareness to insects and the plants that they interact with. Does anybody else have any questions? either uh, on the mic or in the chat. That it looks quiet from what I can see. I think everyone's fallen asleep at my talk, I understand. No, no, no. <laughs> I think people still have their uh, mics muted. Yeah, but there's no, no one's coming on chat either, so hopefully they're all listening intensely and, and very satisfied. I'd have to say, okay. I was a bit like, sometimes my brain switches off when I see DNA, RNA. Yep. Mine does too. <laughs> but no, that that presentation was like, oh yeah, I get that. <laughs> oh great! Oh look, I'm glad because it's it's much. impenetrable. It's an impenetrable field at times, and so I really I try really hard to make it you know approachable because no. yeah. for me it was exactly the same feeling when I started the PhD. I was like, oh my goodness, I don't understand this at all. No, and that's the that's the magic of communicating about tricky stuff. You know, yep. <laughs> it's, it's, couldn't yeah. agree more. Um, so, um, Norm Pinksky has uh, passed on his congratulations on the talk, says thank you. Oh, thank you, Norm. In the chat, yeah. Right. Um, I don't think we've got any other uh, questions uh, there for you, Joshua. Um, Perfect. If we get any comments on the um, YouTube video, once you put it up, I'll make sure we pass them on to you. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'll leave you guys to your meeting and I'm actually oh, going to go no, have we, dinner now. We, oh, we do have a question. We do have a question. Do honeybees show up in the DNA results? Yes, they, they do. Um, at the moment, just looking at it, honeybees are pretty ubiquitous across the samples. Um, like I said beforehand, you know, you're getting a mixture of uh, some, some samples with lots of reeds and some with just a few trace amounts of insect DNA. But yes, honeybees, from the samples that I've looked at at the moment, which are from the peak season, which were the ones that I used for the pilot study, 
they are ubiquitous at the moment in the samples that I've got, very common, um, which is what we'd expect, which is good because it shows that the method is working. The first question, Matt, would you be able to tell which uh, breed of honeybee is visiting? Oh, oh, oh. Um, all I can, so if we're talking subspecies of Apis mellifera, it gets a bit, it gets a little bit difficult because, you know, the, the clarity of differentiation is great between species, but subspecies, it starts to get a bit blurry. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I can tell you now, Apis mellifera, a lot of it. Can I tell you the subspecies? Ooh, I would have to ask what um, I'd have to ask actually the um, bee keepers um, to see what species they brought in and I would infer that <laughs> but I am happy to pull it back and say there are definitely European honeybees on a lot of these orchards but that's a pretty that's a pretty uh, weak weak statement if I was trying to get to those species I know but yeah right yeah okay well, perfect thank you very much for that mm, uh, well I hope you enjoy your dinner if you well, want, too. if the meeting's still going once you've done that you're welcome of course to wander back and see how um, and the rest of the meeting goes, and of course, you're welcome to attend any of our uh, meetings in the future. Uh, obviously, we can't give you the um, uh, the standard gift for our speakers uh, tonight, but hopefully, we can get one of the society's mugs to you before too long. That would be I'll wonderful. Collect, Thank you so I much. I can collect one and make sure it gets to you. Thank you so much. That's really that means a lot. This was lovely to talk to you guys, and uh, I was definitely nervous beforehand, but you've all been a wonderful audience, and I feel uh, feel really good for it. So thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was highly educational. I hope you enjoyed it. Great. Yeah, I know I did. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye, Bye, Bye guys. Josh.